Yeah, welcome back to ThinkTech. This is the Military in Hawaii. The title of our show is Service Member Relief and Military Spouses. And we remind you that May, or in May now, May is Military Appreciation Month. We're going to discuss these matters with Neil uh, Mitsuyoshi, um, and he is a Brigadier General for the United States Army. Is that right? Okay. That's correct, G. When you get to be a general, the uniforms get all sort of <laughs> combined, don't they? <laughs> and Representative Takashi Ono from the Hawaii State Legislature, who is a, a chair of the committee, in, including various things, but military is one of them. Am I right? Spot on. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to favor military today. I'll tell you, my brother, who uh, he and I served together in the Coast Guard for a few years back in the Hmm, late 60s and 70s uh, was just here. And uh, we decided we'd make a list of all the sea stories that we've been telling each other. You know, some of them, you know, they get taller as the years go by, these sea stories. And we made a list and there were like 50 sea stories, all really good. But I'm not going to tell you all the sea stories today. I just want to tell you, we have a list and it's really wonderful to look back. And, I, and I'm, full disclosure, I am so soft on the military. That's my favorite part of my life, actually, as a matter of fact. So we're going to talk about uh, spouses. We're going to talk about relief. Uh, we're going to talk about some bills in the legislature. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, why the military, Neil, why the military cares about this and, uh, you know, why they spend the time and energy to talk to guys like Takashi Ono about bills in the legislature to try to make life a little sweeter for military people who are deployed here in Hawaii. Um, what's the story there? Well, uh, Jay, I think it's really all about quality of life. And for the military, um, specific, when you look at House Bill 961 and 391, um, it's, it's very challenging when a military family um, PCSs. As you know, they, they do a permanent change of station every two to three years, moving all over the world or all over the country. And just that, that challenge alone with just the moving brings so much um, uh lack of continuity and, and challenges to the children, changing schools, um, you know, having to look for new jobs. And part of that problem that we were having with House Bill 961 was a bunch of spouses would come over to Hawaii and not be able to get a, a license quickly. Oftentimes it would take up to four months for them to get a license where they would be um, non-employed during that time. So House Bill 961 basically makes it so that we don't follow a, a reciprocity um, process, um, which requires license equivalency. And spouses who are in the military now have an easier path to get a temporary license quickly so that they can now compete for, for jobs um, in Hawaii that require that license. I'm impressed the Department of Defense you know, wants to do this and that um, you know, PACOM wants to do this. Indo-PACOM, forgive me. Uh, and, um, you know, and, you're, and you're detailed to help do it. Um, what's the what's the motivation? What's the overarching mission and purpose of, of trying to make life better for, say, reciprocal licenses? Right. So, uh, actually, nationwide, the um, Assistant Office of the Secretary of Defense um, has been trying to do this um, nationwide. So, there's reciprocity between states, but specifically in Hawaii, PACOM's looking at the number of spouses and the number of licensed spouses in the workforce. And, and based on those numbers, and I'll, I'll just kind of throw them out there, um, active duty spouses in the total workforce in Hawaii amounts to about 2%. And that's about 15,000 spouses um, that are make up the workforce. And then of those, of those spouses in the licensed workforce, about 3% or about 5,200 of those spouses are in the licensed field. And when, when we look at the license field, if we even drill that down further, especially with health care, military spouses make up about 10% of the health care um, force, and that's about 3,000 people. So you can imagine in a period of like um, COVID, um, that becomes extraordinarily important because not only does that help the military spouses and the military, but I think that really helps the state fill a lot of shortages that, that it needs to um, take care of. Yeah, we really haven't uh, adjusted back to normalcy, even with the president's announcement today, there'll be issues about the workforce. It'll be out of sorts for a while before the number of people, the number of jobs get together. But let me add this. You know, I practiced law for a long time and we were always looking for staff. And when we found a, uh, an applicant who was a military wife or spouse, 
um, we we snapped them up because they were always very good. They were ardent, uh, you know, the work ethic. And you know what? Travel is broadening. Uh, you must know that from your own career. If you if you run around the country and the world, you learn stuff, and uh, you become mm, more sophisticated. I mean, uh, for my money, there should there should be a program for everybody to travel around the world, just like you know, doing public service of some kind. I uh, like the Peace Corps, if you will. If you don't want to be in the military, go into Peace Corps. But anyway, that travel makes these applicants more attractive, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it absolutely does. I mean, I think when you look at military spouses, they're they are very well-rounded, um, very well-rounded employees, and they have a broad base and knowledge of experience. You know, having worked in different locations, different countries, different states, they really understand the complexities of different environments and because they're so used to PCSing all the time, they're very good at quickly coming into a job, assimilating and, and getting into the root of um, making things happen. So that uh, when I, I know a lot of military spouses um, and I've been working with one in particular on this bill who's been testifying for it. And they are always um, top rate individuals on, on every level, you know, personally, professionally and ethically. Are they always women or are they sometimes men? No, absolutely not. We, we have the, the military is a gender blind. And so when we look at spouses and, and as you know, I mean, spouses do not have to be a male and, the fe- and a female in the military. So when we look at spouses, um, we're talking about any dependent who's married to a service member that's in the military. And that that is just as much um, males as they are females. So um, I, I I do not want to make it seem like they are only wives. They are and nor do I, nor do I, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, well, um, so this this bill, who wrote it? Uh, Takashi, did you write it? Did, did Maybe Neil wrote it, so you wrote it together? It's very likely that uh, Neil wrote it. It was introduced <laughs> as a part of the governor's package. And um, the way the legislature works is that the governor is able to introduce uh, legislation on behalf of his many departments. And this was one of them. Um, so on behalf of DOD, uh, I understand that the process is one where they propose ideas to the governor and if they make the governor's final cut, they are introduced uh, in the House and, and the Senate. I do want to clarify, I did not write the bill. I want to give credit where credit is due. And we really owe a lot of credit to um, the DCCA, uh, the Department of Commerce and Consumer um, Protection Agency for the state. So they are the ones that really crafted the bill. And they work very closely with legislators like um, Representative Ono and Senator Baker and Representative Johansson um, to craft that bill. The, this particular bill, 961, was a governor admin bill. So the governor was also in support of it, and it was part of his governor admin package that he submits to the legislature. And he was actually talking with the seniorest levels of the military to with their support and their request um, to get this bill pushed through. So it really was a team effort in getting this bill. And- Did you have any resistance on this? Did anybody actually appear and testify against it? I always wonder about that. And if so, what are their names? I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you their names, addresses, social security, <laughs> go after them, Jay. Okay. Um, well, the first point I make is how you define a peer because no one physically was here at the state capitol to testify or appear before yeah. our committee. Yeah, okay. um, we all did this the same way we're having this conversation now. We did through Zoom. Um, and I did a quick glance at the testimony in the last committee, and it was all very much in favor. Um, I know within our internal discussion, there was some question about the uh, residency requirements that have been laxed. If you want to work for the state of the county, you no longer have to declare being a resident um, after 30 days of accepting that job or starting that job. Uh, um, that did gender some, engender some discussion in, in our internal caucuses, but not enough to stymie the bill. Mm. Well, I mean, are there, are there issues, for example, about some groups of licensees in Hawaii who are very jealous of their prerogatives? You know, we've seen that over the years certain occupations and they really don't want anybody to come in and compete with them. Um, do, you, do you see any of that here? Oh, absolutely I do. I mean, not just with this bill, there are a number of other bills that we've taken for other professions that will go unnamed, um, where they are very organized and they are very resistant 
to folks from the mainland coming into Hawaii and what they perceive as stealing their jobs or stealing their work. Um, some of the industry who want to hire these individuals um, certainly could use the extra hand, uh, but those folks who work in the industry don't. The same dynamic happened with this bill. Um, but, you know, uh, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. It's just best to enjoy it, you know, on a bun. On, uh, uh, absolutely. On the absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like the governor is likely to sign this bill. Am I right? I mean, this is not going to be controversial. And it's going to cross his desk quickly and he's going to sign. All right. And you are absolutely correct. It, the governor, um, our, our recommendation at the department is going to be to at, tell the governor to sign both of the bills. And we believe that he, he will sign both of the bills such so that there will actually likely be a bill signing ceremony for this tied into military appreciation one. Well, perfect, isn't it? Perfect. Um, you said both. So we should talk about the other one now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, House Bill, what is it, uh, 391, uh, which uh, also came out of uh, your committee, Takashi. That's right. Yep. House Bill 391 or HB 391, as we kind of uh, abbreviate here, it creates a process for service members to break or terminate and terminate their rental agreements early without penalty or an obligation to pay future rent. And this can happen if uh, that service member receives orders to move on to government quarters and um, that if that failure to move back results in their loss of housing allowance. Um, there are some stipulations on behalf of the landlord. They must let the landlord know at least 30 days prior in most circumstances. This uh, service member has to have a copy of official military orders to give to their landlord and written pr uh, proof from their commanding officer uh, in order to take advantage of this law. Um, but I understand there's some extenuating circumstances, and Neil mentioned one a little bit earlier, um, that caused some service members who have to break their lease, uh, break their rental agreement. And unfortunately, one of the reasons that's also included in the bill is in the event of death, um, that this would also apply in that case, in that very unfortunate case. Mm, fair enough. Um, although, you know, you don't have to be in the service to die. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a, a, a plenary kind of experience. <laughs> So, um, okay, this one is interesting to me because uh, I was telling you about my, my own service career back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I mentioned before the show, Neil, there was a bill, a statute there. I can see the, the cover sheet of it right now in my memory. It said Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act it was a federal bill. And the general idea is if, uh, see what it was. Oh, yeah. If a member of the military was being transferred, new duty station and all that, he could, he could walk on any contract especially a lease. And it sounds like this is the this is a, a successor or addition to the concept that was embodied in the Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act, which goes back to the Second World War, as a matter of fact. But uh, can you talk about that? Can you talk about how this is different than, you know, the, the classical model of Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. So you, you, are, you are very correct in your statement. And um, I want to start by, you know, thanking um, Representative Ono for House Bill 391 because he was a legislator that actually introduced that bill. And it solves a very um, specific problem about soldiers um, losing their basic housing allowance. So with the civil relief of the, what we call SCRA, that civil relief act that you're talking about, that covers you when you have a change in, in title or station. So as an example, if a soldier was deployed um, to Afghanistan or Iraq, then they would be covered and they would not be required to like be, be beholden to auto, auto car payments or, or rental payments um, leases that they are currently um, encumbered in. But with the civil, with the current um, 391, what happens is soldiers now do not change the status. What happens is they get a divorce or, or they pass or their spouse passes away. And that causes a change in the in their um, appropriation of a housing allowance. And that becomes very significant. And this really um, affects our most vulnerable um, service members. And that's the E1 through E4, you know, our privates and our specialists. So what happens now is they, they have a, a service member that gets divorced, but say he doesn't now um, take ownership of the of any of the children or any of the dependents. Therefore, he loses his housing allowance and must move back on base. Well, that's problematic enough because 
the average rent on Oahu is about $2,300 for a family, which is probably what he, what the soldier had. And now without dependents, he drops from a, um, a pay of about $2,800 to a pay of about $2,100. And now he can no longer afford paying that rental cost. And so now not only is he financially burdened, but in the military, when you, when you do not meet your financial obligations, you end up getting your credit rating gets affected. And now it ends up being an issue that affects the soldier's career because credit ratings now can be tied into security clearances. And now if his security clearance or her security clearance is affected, they might end up losing um, their, their ability to progress in their particular field. So it's a, it's a, it's a very um, uh, relatively small group of people. I think there was about 1,950 um, soldiers that were affected by divorce between 2015 and 2020, but a very significant impact for those soldiers that end up losing that housing allowance. That's a kind, humane thing you did, Takashi. Uh, you're very welcome. You know, this was an example where one of my constituents who happened to be um, also in the, in the service uh, brought this to my attention. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who may not realize that they have people that after you get to vote for someone in an election, they still can advocate on your behalf. And this person, we developed a relationship and they explained to me the issue. It happened to be an issue that fell under the purview of the committee that I was chairing. So with his, uh, with his support and his organizational skills, we introduced it and he, um, we pushed it through all the way to the finish line. Um, this was really community citizen driven. That's great. That's great. And sensitive to the community. And it's a win, win, win. I suppose uh, you didn't have a bunch of landlords uh, lining up uh, to, to say nay. Uh, did you get any resistance on this bill? The realtors, um, you know, as often as the case, um, individuals who get organized, um, like the local realtors association, um, they follow legislation or they find things that affect their membership. And this is one of them. Um, they did have some, uh, a little concern, a little hesitancy about the bill. Uh, and they said, you know, even if it does pass, they will be working closely with their members who happen to be landlords that will, uh, so that they can be prepared that maybe they might have to be subject to this in the future if they rent to a service member. And full disclosure, you know, there is nothing, nothing really passes the legislature that is always a uh, uh, win, 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 win. Some of the realtors do say that perhaps some landlords may be a little more weary of renting to a service member because of a bill like this. Um, nonetheless, we felt it was, it was deserved to pass uh, and head to the governor's desk. You know, for the very reasons you articulated, Neil, I think uh, my experience, and maybe maybe it's still the case, is that a, a service member tenant is going to be at least as reliable as the rest of the community. Um, well, because why? Because the service and his commander will expect him to behave himself ashore. And if he, he makes a mess on his credit or in his behavior ashore, um, that is going to affect his career, and it may result in who knows what kind of a bad report or, um, or you know, even even disciplinary action. And certainly, um, he's not going to get promoted so quickly. So, am I right about that? Uh, I would take a wild guess and say that these days, uh, a landlord would rather have a service member, um, even though uh, this this bill would mm, undermine the landlord's ability to chase him around. Uh, if he was transferred or went back to the base, am I right? Yeah, Jay, you are uh, you are spot on with that comment. So, one good thing is with the military, you do get a housing allowance, which is tied into the particular um, region or area that the service member is actually living in, and the service members are absolutely more reliable, in my opinion. And I, I've heard many stories because we have an extra um, in incentive on the soldier, and that is their commander. And so at any time, if a tenant um, or a landlord has an issue with their tenant, they can always talk to the commander and the commander can help resolve some of these issues in addition to other governmental um, processes and, uh, you know, landlord codes that they can follow through. So I, I agree with you 100 percent that in general, military um, service members are, are much better uh, tenants um, or are very good tenants. Yeah, that's my my recollection, I, I'm not surprised. 
The other thing that this all tells us is that there's a, a kind of a local parentis, um, you know, environment in the service where the service is not just your employer, the service is mm-hmm. your family. Um, and it, it cares. It's institutionally, maybe not personally, but institutionally, your commander usually cares about your welfare, cares that, you know, you be in, in, good, in good, good favor with your neighbors and friends. It cares that, you, you know, you don't, you don't mess up. Um, and uh, I mean, there's various ways to get people to behave themselves. One of them is the carrot and the other is the stick. But bottom line is the service cares, takes an interest in all of that. And just as in the case of both of these bills, um, the service is saying um, we, we um, in order to facilitate your participation in the military, we're going to try to give you a, a rational um useful life experience especially here in hawaii which in which prices and rents are more expensive than in other places you might be assigned and there's a consciousness about that i think you are you neil are an expression of that very consciousness am i right (laughs) yeah so um i i i i agree with you 100 percent um jan you know just interestingly like we were talking about Military Appreciation Month, and and to, this month also happens to be Asian American um, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and and I, I look at those things, um, and especially with AAPI, and I, I think about how it focuses around um, inclusion and around diversity and around um, you know being um, being all in one, and and I think when you're in the military, you just can't help but um, look at all of those things and and operate that way because you have to rely on all of these people to the left and right of you, no matter what, in a, in a, in a, especially in a combat situation. And so having that ability to depend and having that feeling of family and having that feeling of um, no matter who you are, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background is, no matter what your um, race is, no matter what your gender is, we're all on the same team. Yeah, it makes, it makes for a better military at the end of the day. And, and, and you know, that's the bottom line. So, you know, Takashi, one thing is uh, we go back to, uh, you know, the the Navy was in Pearl Harbor in 1850. That's before I was born. And, (laughs) or anyone I know for that man. Can someone um, fact check that? (laughs) Right. We we, we need fact check. Thank you. Fact Fact check. (laughs) So uh, it just strikes me that, you know, Hawaii has a very special relationship with the military. They were here, you know, through such a salient part of Hawaii history. And, of course, you know, we, we've had negative um, experiences like the Massey case, which still throws a bit of a shadow on the relationship with the military and all that. Um, however, you know, if, if people are aware, they, they recognize the, you know, that we're connected at the hip with the military. And you're in an interesting position because uh, you want to you keep that relationship good. And there are... You know, there are things you need to do. I, I, I am sure the two bills we have talked about today are not the only ones. It's an ongoing dynamic process to see what the, the frictions are, the issues are, and what can be done uh, to cement and perpetuate this positive relationship. Um, so I imagine, I would guess that you have bills one kind or another, like all the time uh, in your committee to uh, uh, cement the relationship. Am I right about that? <laughs> we have bills on all sorts of topics, and uh, a lot of them have to deal with the military. Uh, things about leased land, you know, in particular, um, have come up a number of times. Uh, but, you know, Neil and the DOD made these ones easy. Many people look to the legislature, and perhaps they decry the fact that uh, sweeping, monumental pieces of legislation don't happen every year, um, you know, as if the Civil Rights Act would happen, you know once every year, once every other year. Um, The fact of the matter is that here at the legislature, we're problem solvers. There are problems that are out in the community. Many times, if you are lucky enough not to be subject to those, they might not come across your radar, but to some people, they're very, very crucial. They bring their attention uh, to the legislature. Many times we solve a lot of these small problems and make life a little bit better. Um, This is kind of our bread and butter. Uh, And I think that this, the, the legislature does a very good job of uh, uh, delivering results on these types of issues. 
But for everyone else who um, hopes that we would hit a grand slam every year, um, I want to hit a grand slam every year too. But uh, you know, when you try to hit a ball out of the park and you swing hard, you're just more likely to miss uh, more often. <laughs> so um, I think we're really good at singles and doubles, and this is an example. But for some people who really need to get on base, uh, in the in the in the baseball metaphor, uh, they're very happy. Yeah, well, you know, the, all of this, uh, the context of today's national experience, um, points out that you know, democracy is is not all the big sweeping bills. It's a lot of little bills too. And in any event, it's a matter of keeping current with the dynamic in the society. So, you know, the idea, and I think Hawaii is a good example of this. You know, you're watching, you're talking, you have you have contact with your constituents, and they come and tell you about things. Sometimes they're important, sometimes they're not. But Bottom line is you're tuning, you're tuning the law to meet the changes in our society. Uh, I wish I could say the same thing about Congress, but that's another show, another time. <laughs> but you know, the, the truest, best form of democracy is doing that. It's these little bills, uh, maybe not, you know, not, not so little, but significant, um, that 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 tune up our relationship with our government, that make people feel that they have a part of it and make the government feel that they're responsible to their constituents. Now, Hawaii is kind of a, a noble example of that. And I, some years are better than others, you'll agree. But bottom line is uh, we do have a good ethic um, in terms of relating the, the people and the, and, and, and the lawmakers. How do you feel about serving? Is this an important part of your service? Is this committee important for you? Is the military part of this committee important to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm here. I represent my constituents. So, you know, first and foremost, I keep them and their goals, their priorities, their hopes and dreams for the state uh, forefront in my mind. Um, here at the legislature, I have been lucky enough to serve as this chair. So I get to put my stamp, uh, my personal individualized stamp on this little part of the state's policy. Um, so uh, it's 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 been a fun experience. The legislature wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, uh, but there's never any shortage of items to learn. You know, I started off as a teacher and I got to learn the education system. And of course you want to learn about why roads aren't paved and you learn about libraries, but you understand that the state does so many things that go beyond um, what, what meets the eye. And this, this committee and learning about the DOD and service members in Hawaii has been eye-opening and um, engaging. Yeah, I might mention that I'm in the 26th, right across the Poly Highway. Mm. And that means I'm not in the 27th, but I want you to know that <laughs> me and all my neighbors were always watching the 27th. <laughs> well, the grass is greener on the other side, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> both, both sides are related in the same kind of neighborhood, I think. And the interesting thing about the Lehigh and all that is that it's a, a very robust neighborhood. It's got a lot of neighborliness. It is truly a neighborhood with uh, neighborhood integrity, if you will. And so, you know, other neighbor, other neighbors, neighborhoods are not really as attractive. So I admire you for that. And uh, well, we're watching you, Takashi. We're watching you. <laughs> and I'm sure the people in the 27th though, watching what happens in the 26th. It's just, you look over the... So, <laughs> Neil, what you had a, you've had a, a, a tremendous um, army experience. You've been hither and yon. Um, in all, you've been in uh, Iraq and Kuwait, even in harm's way, and uh, you're an engineer, as I recall. Um, and that's that's always interesting. People think the engineers are back in doing blueprints, but it's not true. They're out, they're out in the front line too. Um, so, what has your career been like? You've been in the service for like thirty years. You know, you look like you're twenty, but um, <laughs> let's see how that works. But um, you know, what what do you what do you say to people? What do you say to, to people who might consider? going into the service, uh, taking graduate degrees the way you have, uh, becoming an engineer, and then <clears throat> reaching uh, Brigadier General. That is a really, a really fine career. And so question, what do you suggest to them? Should they consider the Army or any military service now? Well, um, so I, I will say this, Jay, with, with that, I think that's a, a deeply personal uh, decision. I think everybody need, you know, needs to look um, within themselves to de determine um, what they want to do, um, because uh, it, it definitely doesn't come without sacrifice. Um, but for me personally, um, I, I have kind of taken a very um, 
a very different path, I think. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm not actually an active duty member up at US PACOM. I'm actually a member of the um, Hawaii Army National Guard. And so I spent- You've been, you've been switching back and forth. Yeah. I, want, I wanted to ask you, you have, you've been in three characterizations already in your career. And I hope at some point you tell us why you switched back and forth like that. Yeah, so, um, well, I, I've always been a, a, a traditional reservist or, or in the reserve component. Um, graduating from college, and I was actually spent about nine years in the U.S. Army Reserves. And I, I actually moved over um, to the National Guard when I was asked to take a civil service position with the state of Hawaii. It was a requirement to be in the Guard. And then through that, I, I ended up deploying um, for a little less than three years to um, Iraq and, and uh, Kuwait. But what I, what I will say about um, you know, rec- your question about recommending people to be in the service, you know, I, I, I think um, being in the service has a whole bunch of other rewards um, beyond your expectation of just being in the military and doing a military job. I, I think the people in the military are, are really phenomenal, high quality individuals. And I meet some of my best friends and some of my lifelong um, um, compadres um, through the military. And there's nothing like experiencing hardship to really develop those kinds of relationships. And the military also just gives you a a tremendous amount of opportunity to develop. I mean, just coming out of school as a first, you know, second lieutenant, you're immediately put in charge of a platoon, which typically means you're immediately in charge of 30, you know, 30 plus individuals. And I think that kind of growth um, right from the get-go and the type of training that the military um, is willing to invest in its people. I mean, the military is, th- if there's one thing, there's a lot of like technology and a lot of like um, equipment and everything um, to that effect in the military. But when you really get down to it, what makes the US military great is its people. And the military invests an extraordinarily amount of time and money and effort in developing and harnessing that energy of those people. So I think if you have any inkling about um, a feeling of serving, if you feel like you, you know, you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself and you want to be on a team and you, you want to see the world and you also want to um, develop yourself as an individual, I think the military is a fascinating place um, to look at for those things. But again, um, you know, I will caveat it by everybody has to look within themselves to figure out what's um, what's best for themselves. Takashi, after the show, you and I go down to the recruiting office. What do you think? <laughs> I got your six. I got your six, Jay. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, one thing that strikes me, and this is my, my last question because we're running out of time. Um, back to the something called the Educational Training Fund ETF back in the, I guess it was in the 1990s, where the state gave you a, 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 a lifetime um, fund to spend on training yourself. And ultimately, it was defunded and it went away. Um, but it was like $5,000. You can go to courses, you can learn, you can improve your skills, and you can make a better day. And in a funny way, that was emulating what Neil was talking about. Training, 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 always education, post-school education. It seems to me that, um, you know, Hawaii and the business community in Hawaii, maybe more, you know, in the academic community too, maybe other kinds of communities, the governmental community, um, can learn from what is right here in our lap, that is the military. The military does provide good careers. Um, It does treat its people well. And more than anything, it trains them. And the, the, the training element of, of what Neil is talking about is really appealing because sometimes people go through careers here in Hawaii and other states, they never get trained. Their employers are not going to pay for anything. And they just, uh, you know, it's cradle to grave, just do the job. If you want to learn something, go home and read a book. Um, what do you think about that? Can we learn from the military? Can we take some of these culture points away and, 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 and plant them, plant little trees? Um, you know, in the state to to have the state function maybe in the same career minded way. Do we want more Neils running around the state? That is questionable. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all truth, no, I have everyone I've dealt with as a chair of this committee uh, on the service member on the DOD side has all they have been full of earnestness, humility, 
and intellect. It's again, it's been a joy. Um, uh, and I feel that other folks who are also uh, perhaps wondering uh, where to go in their life might might do well to get coffee with Neil or other folks in the service. Um, you mentioned the Peace Corps. I did a program called Teach for America a number of years ago. Oh, sure, There's sure. A lot of programs in which you can get involved in in uh, in your community at large. Um, and I encourage anyone who's interested to to do those things. I think I think that they'll make you into a better person eventually. Um, Neil, do you have a response, perhaps? Yeah, I have to agree with you one hundred percent, sir. When when you talk about um. Uh, service, right? I, I think there's so many other ways aside from the military that you can serve your, your nation and serve your community. And, and so I'm glad you bring up um, things like the Peace Corps, you know, working for the government, getting involved in politics. I mean, there's so many other ways. And I think what's important is people need to remember that um, deep down, I, I think it's very important for us to look just beyond ourselves and, you know, have a, a little humility and have a little understanding of um, the greater good. And I think if more of us really looked at the greater good and looked at serving and looked at um, supporting their community and supporting their fellow um, individuals, I think we'd be a much better place and a much better world. Thank you, gentlemen. It's altruism that binds us. Thank you so much, Representative Takashi Ono. And uh, General Neil Mitsuyoshi, I really appreciate coming on the show, and I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jay. Thank Aloha. you, Representative.